we're talking about um, comparing different polynomial representations. The question says the polynomial f is given by f of x equals x plus 5 times x minus 6 times x plus 2. And the polynomial function g is given by the graph below. A third polynomial h is a second degree polynomial that has roots at negative, nine, or negative 2 and 9 with a maximum at the point 3.59. Which function or functions is always increasing on the interval between negative 10 and negative 5? All right, so the first thing that we want to do is just get a grasp of each function. This is g of x here. Uh, we have eight, uh, f of x given to us as an equation, and then h of x is described with its roots, its maximum, and its degree. And so we kind of want to be able to see where it's increasing, where it's decreasing. We want to compare the functions. And the best way to do that is to try and graph them so that we can sort of see, well, what's happening. So for example, let's just take the one we already have, and we're thinking about the interval from negative 10 to negative 5. What's happening to this function? Well, it's pretty clear that the value is decreasing as I approach negative 5. And so we can kind of already, from the get-go, sort of nix g of x. But we want to compare f of x and h of x. So our plan is going to be to graph those functions and then see if they're increasing or not. So at this point, I want you to just pause the video, go through, um, graph both, and come to a conclusion and an explanation, and then start it again and see how you do. So for f of x, it's a third degree polynomial, and it has roots at negative 5, positive 6, and negative 2. And I know the basic shape of a positive uh, cubic function is going to look just like that. And so I know the end behavior as I'm moving from left to right is going to go upwards. And I know that each of my roots comes from a factor with multiplicity of 1. So it's going to pass through at each root. And so I can graph f of x just like that. Moving on to h of x. and h of x is a second degree polynomial, so for h of x, I'll just kind of write down the things that we know about h of x. It's going to have a parabolic shape, and I know the roots. So let me go ahead and graph those roots. I know that they occur at negative 2 and positive 9. And that's nice and all, but remember, I still need to know which way does it go through those roots. And this next piece is hopefully going to tell me that. So I know there's a maximum value that occurs when x is 3.5 and y is going to be 9. And now I can clearly see how my parabola must go. I cannot have an upward uh, facing parabola because I would just not, it wouldn't be possible for that shape to intersect all those points. So my parabola is going to look something like that. And now I can definitely, actually very easily, tell what's happening to each of these functions between uh, negative 10 and negative 5. It's very clear if I look at f of x that as I move towards negative 5 from negative 10 that the value is increasing. And similarly, for f of x, it's also increasing. Right? I can tell that if I were to extrapolate this backwards to negative 10, as I move closer and closer to negative 5, the values are getting bigger. It's important not to get caught up in the fact that just because g of x has positive values, so it's positive everywhere up until negative 5, that it's also increasing. The positive values are getting smaller and smaller, whereas for f of x and h of x, even though it has negative values, those negative values are getting closer and closer to zero, and so it's increasing. If I were at negative 400 here, up here I might be at negative 200, and that is clearly an increase. So the function or functions, it's two of them, which are increasing on that interval, are going to be h of x and f of x. All right, one more example. Um, and here we have the quartic function defined by p of x and the line L, which is represented by the data points uh, below in the table. Which function has a larger y-intercept? So in order to wrap my head around this, I need to figure out what I'm being asked, and that's which has a larger y-intercept. 
think about what that means. How could you figure out uh, the y-intercept? Hopefully you realize that that's when the x value is zero, right? If I were to picture a graph really quickly, the y-intercept is going to be some point on the y-axis, and that's going to happen when x is zero, okay? And so in order to figure out the y-intercepts of each um, so that I can compare them, I, I'm going to need to find out what happens when I plug in zero uh, as my independent variable. Well, thinking about p of x, that's actually not very hard because p of 0 is easily computable because I have the function already. So here, the representation that's probably most beneficial is to actually have the function. And when I plug in 0, we can do a little mental math. I'm going to get 2 times 1, which is 2. Then I'm going to have negative 1 squared, which is positive 1. So I'm going to end up with a positive 2. So that's the y-intercept for p. Now, I have to do a little bit more work for the next function. So here, I have a line. And I want you to just jot down, take a couple of seconds to jot down what you know about a line. And then press play. So the things that I know about a line, um, the first thing is that it has a constant slope. Right? The slope never changes. It always increases by the same amount every step of the way. And using that, I can actually find, I can just step you know, from one space to another knowing how much I'm going to either increase or decrease. And so if I look at my table here, notice that I want to know the y-intercept, right? I want to know what happens when I plug in 0 um, for x, right? I'm trying to figure out what that value will be. And if I can just find the slope, I know that I'll be able to move from negative 1 um, and 2 down to my next value. There are other ways to do it, so if you have another idea, pause the video and go ahead, go for it, and then come back and see how we do. So in order to do this, I'll just draw a little graph for us to see what's going on. I know that at negative 6, my x value of negative 6, I have a y value of 4. At negative 1, I have a y value of 2. And at 4, I have a y value of 0. I should probably move that up a little bit. And so I'm going to have some sort of straight line here. And if I can find the slope, then I should be able to find any point along that line. So what's the slope? Well, the slope is going to be the change in the x direction divided into the change in the y direction. And this should sound pretty familiar, the change in y over the change in x. And because it's a straight line, I can use any two points. And the slope between those two points has to be the slope of the whole line. So here my change in x is going to be 5, and my change in y is going to be two, uh, negative 2. And so I'm going to end up with negative 2 over 5, negative 2 fifths. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's the slope of my graph. So my straight line is y equals negative 2 fifths x plus some initial value, usually use b. And that's my y-intercept. You might be wondering, OK, well, how am I now going to find this y-intercept? And there's a couple of ways. So pause again and, and see if you can come up with a way on your own, and then check back. So notice here that I have all these points. And in my equation, I'm missing three values, right? I have a y variable, an x variable, and a, and a b value that I don't know yet. And notice that this b variable, this, this b value, has to be the same no matter what. It can't change, right? So if I plug in an x and a y point, this b variable, it, it, it's got to be the same no matter what it is that, um, no matter which point I plug in. Right, because I'm, I'm following a straight line, and this b variable represents my y-intercept uh, whenever x is, is 0. So the first thing that I would try to do is I would just plug in any point. So let's just take the point 4, 0. So if I plug that in, negative 2 fifths times 4 plus b. And the question is, what will be equal? So uh, go ahead and take a second and solve that. Come back when you're done. 
So in solving this, right, negative 2 fifths times 4 is going to be negative 8 fifths. And I want to make that 0. Well, let's think about it. Negative 8 fifths plus what is 0? Pretty simple. It's got to be positive 8 fifths. Right? There's really no other way it can be. Um, so I know now that my y-intercept is 8 fifths, right? If I were to plug in 0 for x, all I would be left with is 8 fifths, or 1 and 3 fifths. And I can further see how that works now because my slope is negative 2 fifths, meaning every step in the x direction that I make, I am decreasing by 2 fifths. So if you notice, this point here at negative 1 comma 2, when I moved one step in the x direction, I decreased by 2 fifths in the y because I went from 2 to 1 and 3 fifths, which is a decrease of 2 fifths. So my y-intercept for this function, let's just call it um, g of x, when I plug in 0 here, I'm going to get 8 fifths as my y-intercept, and so the one which has a larger y-intercept is going to be p of x.